So, good evening, everybody. My name is Timmy Frawley, and I am an Associate Professor in Mental Health Nursing and a member of the UCD Neurodiversity Working Group. And I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening to our first session in the UCD Neurodiversity Masterclass Series of 2022. I'm particularly delighted to welcome two very distinguished speakers uh, to uh, speak with you this evening. Uh, Davida Hartman is a principal psychologist, clinical director and co-founder of the Children's Clinic, providing clinical services to children up to 18 years of age with a strong emphasis in supporting autistic children. She also founded the Adult Autism Practice where she is principal psychologist and clinical director. Both practices provide respectful neurodiversity affirmative assessments and services for the clients they support. Davida is also an author at Jessica Kingsley Publishers and is an adjunct professor in the UCD School of Psychology. This evening, Davida is joined by Tara O'Donnell Killen, who is a research practitioner and founder of Thriving Autistic, a nonprofit dedicated to the advancement of human rights for autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people. At its core, Thriving Autistic is a global team of neurodivergent psychologists, therapists, and allied healthcare professionals who provide supportive services for the autistic community alongside consultancy, education, and training for the wider community. Well, Tara and Davida are authors of the Adult Autism Assessment Handbook, a neurodiversity affirmative approach, published by Jessica Kingsley and due out next year. So I'm very pleased to say uh, that we will have what I hope will be a very informative discussion on adapting to a neurodiversity affirmative paradigm in clinical practice, which I believe is something of great interest to my own profession of mental health nursing, but right across the board, I'm sure this will uh, touch a chord with, with many. So over to you, uh, Davida and Tara, and thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thanks so much, Timmy, really appreciate that. And thanks to the International Neurodiversity Society Working Group for inviting myself and Tara to talk tonight. We're absolutely delighted to be here talking about something that we're really passionate about. And you're absolutely right, Timmy. That was one of the first things that I, we were going to talk about was that this really applies across the board to everybody at working in a range of different services. We're talking about research, um, academia, clinical services. It applies to nurses, occupational therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists across the, across the board, um, even to employers in more traditional business settings that it um, is directly applicable. Um, so yes, Tara, was there anything else you wanted to add there? No, just we're delighted to be here and it's great to um, spend another hour together sharing our favorite topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> both, of our, um, both of our, one of our special interests. Um, okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is we're gonna go through 12 ways that you can adapt your service, um, how you work as an individual or as a team to neuroaffirmative practices. And then we're going to have, we're gonna talk for about 40 minutes. And then at the end, there's going to be a Q and A um, for about 20 minutes. And we'll be delighted to answer any of your questions that you have at that stage. So just really briefly, and then we're going to go through each point individually. Um, what we're going to be talking about is number one, ensuring that the neurodivergent voice is at the center of everything we do. And we're talking, we're talking today generally about broader neurodivergence and neurodivergent people. But me particularly, my area of expertise would be with the autistic community and autistic children and adults. But so a lot of our examples that we might use today might be specific to the autistic community, but a huge amount of what we're gonna talk about is more broadly applicable to um, to broader neurodivergence, ADHD, dyslexia, and other areas. Um, so number two, that there's value in diversity and in a disabled life. Number three, it's about reframing autism from what we've traditionally thought of it as a disorder. And again, bro to broader neurotypes as well, to a neurotype, to stop pathologizing neurodivergent ways of being, to target individual needs, not neurodivergent ways of being, to employ neurodivergent people, to respect neurodivergent culture and identity, 
It means a rejection of behavior-based compliance approaches, a rejection of neurotypical social skills training. Uh, it means advocating for systems change, fostering a positive neurodivergent identity, and that all neurodivergent people deserve an equal voice and power, not just a small subset. So that's a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about. Okay, Tara. Thank you. And um, so our first point really, and it's, you know, laying the foundation for everything that you do if you're shifting the paradigm of your practice to be neurodivergent affirmative is to ensure that the neurodivergent voice is at the center of everything you do. And whether that is um, an autistic person, uh, somebody with ADHD, whatever neurodivergence that you're working with, that you have to ensure that that voice is at the center. That means um, that the people who are uh, the neuro minority are the ones who are informing what you do. Um, everything that you, all the research, you're, you're, you're aware of the culture, our, cult, our neurodivergence culture, um, everything that you do in terms of support has to be um, based on what neurodivergent people ourselves want as support mm -hmm. goals, rather than trying to make neurodivergent people into a version of a neurotypical person. And that has traditionally and historically been um, with possibly the best intentions, the, the way that we used to, to work. And now we're realizing the harms inherent in that and the, the really terrible harm that has that has caused. So ensuring the, the voice of neurodivergent people being at the center, that is core, a core step that you just can't proceed further unless you do this. And that's not having a tokenistic person or consulting or running ideas by neurodivergent people and then carrying on with what you think anyway. Um, even research priorities down to whatever it is, it has to be coming from the community that you want to support. Davida, do you want to jump in? Anything else I'm missing here? Yeah, no, I mean, just to like as a very specific example, it might be that somebody would do a, a neurotypical person might do a piece of research and decide what they're going to research, do the research, do the, you know, write up, or write up the re everything to do with it and then think, oh, I'm going to run this by a token uh, neurodivergent person to read and see what it's like. That's not that's not at the center. That's not putting um, the autistic or otherwise neurodivergent person at the center of that. Putting them at the center would be, OK, I want to support this community. What are their priority goals for something that I could do research with and bring autistic people in from the very start in terms of helping you design the model of 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 research that you do, whether it aligns with the goals of the, of the autistic community. Because oftentimes we, we can think, oh, this is something that I think would really help the autistic community. You know, a robot that, that, that will tell you the emotions and, and they'll think, oh, this is great. You know, people will think, and I, I'm neurotypical, so I, I would do the same. I think, oh, this is something that might really help autistic people. But you, once you say it to the community, you'll hear very quickly whether they actually want that or not. And if they don't want that, well, then, you know, you really need to, to look again at maybe doing a different type of research or adapting it. So that's a more a specific example of. Yeah, is that OK, Tara? Yeah, yeah. Um, so th that there's value in diversity, and these are two different two, two different concepts. Being near diversity affirmative is realizing there's value in diversity and there's also value in a disabled life. So realizing that there's value in diversity, it's not just about what we often hear is, oh, you know, um, ADHDers or, or autistic people, they have such great strengths and these strengths can really contribute to society. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that there's actual value in diversity itself, like how we've seen with biodiversity and what a negative impact it can have on our ecosystems to, to have uh, to, to impact on biodiversity and have less biodiversity that there is a value um, and a benefit to just having a diversity of, of, of brains and people. Um, and so recognizing that and valuing that. And the second part there is, is realizing that there's value in a disabled life. And this is a really hard one because we've all grown up with um, messages, both implicit and explicit about disability. And we all hold, whether we are disabled ourselves or not disabled, 
we all hold a great amount of ableism around and shame around disability. And in Ireland, there would be a, a huge impact of this. You know, disability would have been hidden away. Um, it would be very unusual until very recently for people to be, and still within Ireland, it's actually extremely difficult for people to be openly disabled and to disclose their disability. That's a whole other issue. Um, so we really need to look at how we view disability and why we view disability and why we hold that shame around disability and, and look at how the systems around us, how closely it is linked to kind of capitalist ideals around being productive. So that, say for example, we have this idea that to be in society, you need to be productive and you need to be independent. So you need to be basically making enough money that you're not causing the system to have to pay for you and that you're independent again, that you have less care needs for the system to, for the system to care for you. And the fact is that there's lots of disabled people, including neurodivergent people that will need support for the rest of their lives, that will need accommodations that might and might not. And there's lots of people who will of course have jobs, um, but there's going to be lots of people that will need support, but it's that value system of they still deserve to be uh, treated and uh, supported within society as having a valued life, even if they are disabled and even if they um, need support or may need support for the rest of their lives. So it's a shift in thinking around even how we think about um, disability in ourselves and others. Tara, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, one of the huge misunderstandings around um, the neurodiversity movement is that it's there's um, that that it's a push away from saying that we have we're disabled mm -hmm. or we have disabilities and it's it's trying to separate ourselves. It's not at all. Neurodiversity mm -hmm. is not about it being all unicorns and rainbows. It's not. It's mm -hmm. acknowledging that every single human life has equal value. It doesn't yeah. matter the color of your skin, your gender, your sexuality, or your neuro, or your neurotype. It doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So it's really coming from that, just a basic human equality for every life on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because the, again, just to reiterate what you said, that there is this, you often hear criticisms of the neurodiversity movement that it's oh, only for a, you know, a small section, I would never use this language, but a small section of high functioning individuals. Now, I wouldn't use that language. I'd say, you know, low care needs, but it is something that you'd hear a lot. And as Tara said, it's it's such a gross misunderstanding of the neurodiversity movement because the neurodiversity movement is part of dis the dis wider disability movement and disability activism. And disability activism was always about bringing everybody along um, and supports for everybody. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Tara. So, um, thank you. So the next point that we have, that, that we've, and I suppose as well, it's important to say these aren't just our ideas, myself and Davida, these are, this is what we're learning from all our work with the community. I'm autistic. I've got three autistic children. Um, I have, I, I'm working, I'm employing, we've got 21 neurodivergent um, psychologists, psychotherapists, occupational therapists, coaches, um, all working together to support the community and to educate the wider community. But what we're finding is that Really, this is, you know, at its core as well about reframing autism. I know we're talking about the wider um, neurodivergence movement as well, but spe specifically here about autism. We're talking about reframing autism from a disorder to understanding that it is a neurotype. And it is just, you know, 20% of the people are estimated to um, have a divergent neurotype. So we're a minority group. And up until very recently and still uh, um, you know go uh, ongoing depending on the context we're we're experiencing a huge amount of prejudice um so and even when we were talking there in the last slide about the disability and people with high care support needs and low care support needs but i see day in day out are people where um on the surface they may be able to go to work they may be married or have children um, but nobody else has any idea how much work they have to put into being able to maintain that, um, to maintain that level of activity. So oftentimes with autistic people, we can have really um, the areas that we have a lot of special interest in and strong focus on. We can be really proficient in those areas. And if you see us at that, you would expect that kind of level across the board. 
However, we don't we don't work like that. We can often be really excellent in some areas and just in other areas find it absolutely impossible. So we see that across the board and just with regard to that support needs piece, it's fluid, it fluctuates, it's not um, it's not something that's ever fixed for for neurodivergent people. It changes throughout the lifespan, the level of care needed and also and support needed and also even on a day to day basis, it can change. Um, so just simply changing that in our mindsets from, you know, autism is not a disorder that can be fixed. We're just simply uh, have a neurotype. Mm. Exactly. And this is I mean, this is a very new way of looking at autism and looking at other different neurotypes, because, you know, any of the most of the um, guidelines, the diagnostic. I mean, how we diagnose autism at the moment, the DSM-5, the ICD-10. They are, you know, it is the language of disorder. It is the language of disease. It is, you know, it talks about symptoms, the, the, the way to get a diagnosis of autism and ADHD and all those other things. It, it is currently through manuals, which are classifying it as a disorder. So it is a very new way of looking at it. And it's coming, it's community based and it's coming up from the community. Um, and there's a lot of research and there's going to be a lot of, there's a real explosion recently around this. It's, it's, it's all coming. But it, it hasn't quite reached. There's a lot of publications that I would know um, through, for example, Jessica Kingsley Publishers, who specialize in autism specifically. Um, there's a lot of publications coming out next year in 2023 with this framing. And there's a lot more research coming out as well. But it's not it's not there at the moment. I mean, you, realistically, you Google ADHD, you Google autism, you do Google all these things. It's, you know, what comes up is it's an autism spectrum disorder. It's a disorder. Um, and so... Um, it's about so and, and then to classify it, then it's the symptoms. Um, but yes, so so basically, essentially, in a nutshell, what I'm saying is, is that it, it's a moving away from this. And it, it's not, again, like a Pollyanna um, there, you know, everything is rosy in the garden. Um, it's all strengths and there's no challenges. Every different neurotype would have its own strengths and challenges in the same way of being as, neuro, as, as neurotypical. But what the neurodiversity movement um, and paradigm is really trying to put forward is that there wasn't this because, sorry, I will stop talking in a minute about this particular thing, but it's like the medical model of, of looking at neurodivergence is that there was this perfect brain. And so there was this absolutely perfect brain and then something went wrong to that brain. And the thing that went wrong to that brain was autism or the thing that went wrong to that brain was ADHD. But instead, framing it as a neurotype is saying, no, it wasn't that there was a perfect brain and something went wrong and then that person was autistic. It was just a different brain from the very start. It's an autistic brain. It's a neurotypical brain. It's an ADHD brain. And of course, there's a whole mix. I mean, we won't even go into the mix of all the different ones because it's, it's not like that, that there's an autism brain and a neurotypical brain. That's way too simplistic. But that it's that they're all on equal footing. There isn't one better than the other. Yeah. There's, there's no gold there's standard different. brain. There's no gold different. standard brain. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, sorry, I'll move on to this. So again, if there's no standard brain, um, a, a part of this is to stop pathologizing neurodivergent ways of being. So what we mean by that is that say for so and I can understand why this happens, because say in the DSM-5 or the ICD-10, which are diagnostic manuals, um, the way to get a diagnosis of a lot of these what are classified as disorders is, you know, you know, disordered communication, you know, inappropriate eye contact, you know, all these lists and lists and lists of things that somebody did wrong. And because they did that wrong, they got this disorder. Um, but actually, when you look at these things, there's a value judgment in it, because really, you know, who says making eye contact is, is the way that we are supposed to communicate? Who says we're all supposed to be amazing at chit chat? Who says we're all supposed to sit down in class for nine hours and not fidget? You know, so really, we, a huge part of this is, for, and this is a societal wide thing, this isn't, um, this is across the board in, in every environment, to stop looking at, uh, or stimming, for example, what's wrong, there's absolutely nothing wrong with stimming, like who decided that that's a disordered thing to do, it's only in our, in, in, in our society, so it's about stopping looking at things like, for example, eye contact stimming, need to move around, and saying there's something wrong with that that we need to fix, and instead just going, well, that's just their way of being, 
you know? And of course, if somebody's hurting themselves or they're self-harming, of course they need support with that. And of course, children need to learn skills. And of course, we all need to learn to communicate in ways that we can communicate. So it's not about saying, we're not gonna support people. We're not, you know, people don't need therapy, nothing like that. But it is about looking at core ways of being and saying there's something wrong with that. That's what needs to change. Mm. It's yeah. all those value judgments that are yeah. that are inherent in the way we look currently at autistic ways of being or ADHD ways of being and yeah. try and change them to match what we this golden standard, you know, that we're holding up to one particular type of brain. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So actually, that falls really well into this this piece, which is around. So what do you do if you if you want to support somebody who's neurodivergent and they're coming to you and they're saying, look, I need some help. I'm really struggling. So, well, what you do is you, you work with them again. Back to slide one, you know, put the neurodivergent voice at the center. What do they need? What are their needs? What are they looking for support with? So rather than sitting back and looking at, say, the DSM lists of what, what those of us in the neurodivergent community see as um, traumatized individuals that that's you know you have to be a traumatized autistic get to get to get a diagnosis currently um so rather than that rather than looking at okay what are you know autistic traits and trying to eradicate them ask the person in front of you what do you need what are you struggling with lots of us can could really use some support around things like um the environmental fit of of how we experience the world and the environment we're in, in say the workplace or at home. And um, if you're a parent and you have autistic children like me, and this happens all the time, that you might have one parent who has a real need for peace and quiet and calm and one child who is also autistic, but has the opposite need for lots of loud noise and crashing and jumping on you and all that kind of thing. So how do you support a family? in that in 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 that and to allow them both or allow them all to be authentically themselves but figuring out how to accommodate the needs when they're when they're um when they're clashing like that so then also some people i i we have adults sometimes coming to us who want some support with um i suppose unpacking neurotypical social skills and understanding neurotypical social world and so rather than coming to that, and we'll talk about this later, rather than coming to that from, oh, there's this one perfect way of behaving in social world. Um, it's more talking, thinking of it in terms of cultural differences and, you know, different languages and learning to speak different languages. Because in the later, later on, we'll talk again about research showing that within autistic culture, for instance, and the neurodivergent culture and communities, there is no problem within the in-group communicating within each other. Um, it's more of a difficulty in intergroup relations. So again, just targeting the individual needs, what the person actually wants support with. Davida, what am I missing here? Nothing. No, that was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> As always. <laughs> Um, so employing neurodivergent people. So again, this is part of, and I hate, you know, I think there's a lot of talk at the moment, particularly in business, in big business around, oh, the value in, in employing uh, a range of people because for business reasons, because it's increased productivity and brings more money into the company and all of that is great and needed. But actually there, there is a huge amount of benefit to employing neurodivergent people besides you know, making money for the system. Um, now both myself and Tara would employ, you know, we employ um, neurodivergent and autistic people in the adult autism practice and in the children's clinic. Um, and we've tried really, I've tried really hard from the very start to employ professionals um who are autistic and otherwise neurodivergent now there's massive issues societally it's very hard you know i've had a lot of contact from autistic psychologists particularly who um aren't ready they know they're autistic but um they are very fearful probably a lot of the times quite rightly based on 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 things that have happened to them when they have told people about being openly autistic as a psychologist because there's issues or there's a lot of outdated notions around theory of mind that how could you be a psychologist and autistic because you wouldn't be able to put yourself in another piece, person's shoes which is all rubbish um so it's hard to find I suppose what I'm trying to say is even though I'm really actively 
personally trying to to hire autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people um it has been it has been hard but it has been very very worth it and for the team it's it's so also it increases creativity there's all kinds of research around cre in, uh, increasing creativity and productivity and all of that but actually much much more important than any of that which is the core point is that if you are supporting neurodivergent people you are going to support them way better if there is neurodivergent people on your team I, and from the very start and it's all part of that you know neurodivergent people being at the core and having the voice of everything you do you know from my own personal experience with the adult autism practice I mean Tara has been myself Tara helped me set it up I mean we're, we've been you know co-creators from the very start and thriving autistic and adult autism practice are kind of like sister companies in a sister way co yeah sister companies so but the the difference in like personally from our point of view from the very start of designing designing how we do the assessments designing the materials designing the information um, and so from the start, it has, it has changed everything we do and having autistic people there as part of the, the when we might have like a difficult case and, and in peer supervision, it makes such the difference. It has really improved um, everything we do. So it's not just a tokenistic thing. It actually improves ev uh, everything. Tara, did you want to? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I fully agree with you. And um so just again back to the biodiversity you know framework like in neurodiversity if 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 you have more brains at the table you're going to have more perspectives it just makes logical sense we find the yeah. same in thriving autistic like we're a non-profit but we find the same we're, we're all everyone's neurodivergent but we have publicly a, a large amount of neurodivergent people publicly on our website offering services but then privately we have another unfortunately probably maybe 30 percent who don't feel safe to be out in their profession so they are working with us and we refer people to them but they're not publicly listed on the website or anything which is just an indication of of the climate yeah. that we're you know in at the moment and that we're still pushing to to change so that's why events like this are so important and it's so important for everyone who's here tonight and maybe hopefully watching on replays and so forth to to be part of this change to really make this um you know equality happen across the board for all minorities exactly and i mean you may not yourself be in a position of course yourself to employ neurodivergent people that it, but that no. doesn't mean you couldn't advocate for it within the systems that you're in you know absolutely and there's such a push for diversion and inclusivity now oh yeah um across the board but it has to include neuro minorities mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah um and i think we've touched on this before mm -hmm. but just to say again this is really core to everything that we do um is and we i suppose aspire to obviously i'm neurodivergent our team is but we aspire to continually respect neurodivergent culture and identity and there's a huge i mean social media has been such a positive for the community in terms of gathering and meeting one another and normalizing so many different um experiences and ways of being um that autistic and adhd people particularly share so many different um overlapping experiences traits and um but just even forming that you know that positive identity gaining um gaining community gaining the the understanding of oh why things have been so difficult or why things are so difficult and everybody else seems to be doing it so easily and claiming the identity of being neurodivergent understanding that rather than spending which most late diagnosed people have spent their the majority of their life feeling like they're just failing all the time and why does it look so easy for everyone else so this um you know shifting into claiming this identity of being neurodivergent understanding that meeting others in in the community really has helped release so much shame for people it's been massive the feedback we get every day from people it's just so it's so life transforming to to recognize that you're 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 not wrong you didn't do anything wrong in your life you just had a different type of brain and um the world around you wasn't built for that type of brain yeah and i think the thing is that a lot of people don't realize that there's actually a, cult, a, a culture and identity around all these things i mean even down to you know symbol symbols that that the, the autistic community because i know more about the autistic community you know that they hate the puzzle piece they find really offensive um but the rainbow affinity piece which is often associated with the with neurodiversity they really mm -hmm. like 
Um, yeah, and the or gold, say the color blue, blue, you know. Yeah, I think the color blue, hated. Hated. Yeah. Um, there, you know, and they're just small things, but there's also, you know, jokes and sense of humor and all of these different things um, that I don't think that, that people are aware of, but it, but it's very clear. It's funny because, um, and it, it's all on social media. I suppose the thing is that if you're a professional working with uh, autistic children or adults or neurodivergent children or adults, I think if you weren't on social, now when I say social media, Twitter, what are the big, like I, Twitter would be my big one, but also Instagram, TikTok, there's Facebook. loads and loads of younger oh. creators, younger yeah. divergent creators um, on TikTok really yeah, spreading TikTok awareness. Yeah, TikTok videos are brilliant. And, yeah. oh, they're so <laughs> brilliant. They, they're so funny. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, if you weren't on those, and I, I would really recommend the professionals join specific, you know, join specifically for that reason, because you have to keep up to date with this kind of stuff. And it really shows when you don't, because I often see people uh very well, very, very well meaning tweeting something, say it's autism day and tweeting, uh, I don't know, they do a picture of the, a blue puzzle piece and they're like, you know, let's help children with autism, for example. Okay, so there you go. They've used the, the puzzle piece and they've said with autism, which is, you know, which is lang language that the autistic community reject. And then all these people are like, why? They're clearly not listening to us. They're clearly not. It's so yeah. disres it's so disrespectful to the community but but I can see that that person was really well meaning but but you, you so it, it's just it's really important to keep up to date basically but it's easy I mean if you're on Twitter and you follow some there's loads of advocates um speaking out about all this kind of stuff so it is possible but probably not possible outside social media would you think Tara yeah well unless you come to all of these webinars. Oh yeah, well yeah. <laughs> or, I mean, or, some great, yeah. there's some great um there's some great Irish uh, autistic and neurodivergent people, you know, running webinars and running free yes. educational things. And then there was Neuro Pride Ireland last year. Yeah. It was absolutely amazing gathering um, mm -hmm. free online for the community and also for teaching people outside of our community about our culture. So yeah, yeah there's so much yeah. out there. There's so much. Yeah, there is. Um, okay, so just really briefly, the, the autistic community anyway, and I mean, I suppose the thing is that the rejection of behavior based compliant approaches like ABA would have been very much targeted towards um, autistic children, um, rather than the broader uh, neurodivergent um, community or population. Um, and so look, the, the autistic community are really, really at one and clear that they very much reject these kind of approaches. There's a lot of people talking out at the moment about um, the, how they felt that it was traumatic, how they feel it's not respectful to them as autistic, uh, their autistic identity. You know, when you look back at, you know, there's quotes from Lovas who, who um, developed ABA, who says things like about autistic children that you don't have a, you have a person, you have a child in the physical sense, but not the psychological sense. And you have to basically make a person. So this is the, this is the guy that kind of invented ABA. So there are loads of very well-meaning people working in ABA and, you know, hands up. I worked in an ABA school for a year, you know, much to my shame um, a long time ago. So, and I know that, you know, all the people there were there because they wanted to help people. And I know that, that, that there are, there's a lot of talk about changes within the industry. Um, and there has been enormous changes within the industry, but the research still coming out that I've seen is still quite ableist and wouldn't necessarily involve the the autistic community in it um but i think the most important thing for me is that there's a community of people who are saying we don't want this for our community so if there's going to be change i think there needs to be a lot of engagement with the community um from the very get-go and a lot more communication would you agree tara Oh, 100, 150 <laughs> percent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there, there, it has its roots as far as the autistic community is concerned. It has its roots in gay conversion therapy. And that's all we needed to know to say. We don't want that. Thank you. We don't want to be converted into being a neurotype that we're not and trying to pretend to be something because that causes us so much harm. We know that masking or being unauthentically yourself causes so much harm our community has one of the highest suicide rates of any neuro minority so it's just really detrimental to our well-being and when we see um and i agree with you that i know lots of lovely people who went in and learned aba and thought they were doing the right thing 
Um, but when we see the ABA community specifically, I'm talking about making change without consulting the autistic community and making changes as to what they think they should change it to be. And it's yeah. still not using the language we want, still going for um, therapeutic goals that we don't want and not addressing me in any meaningful way what we're asking for, then it's just being rejected outright. It's just we're not, we're still not being listened to and we're still being talked over as a minority and told what's best for us. Yeah. So if you see anywhere, I mean, it's part of the near being neurodiversity affirmative. If you look at, you know, any of the, the kind of modern discourse around what it means to be neurodiversity affirmative or to be part of the neurodiversity movement, it will all, all of them will always include a rejection of the compliance based behavioral approaches. Yeah. Mm. So it's, I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's not even just us saying this. This is part of the this is 100 percent part of the, the broader movement. And, yeah. you know, like just as well on that compliance yeah. piece specifically, um, just to move away from just ABA, because it can be called loads of different things. Yeah. yeah. That idea of teaching somebody compliance, distress tolerance, you know, mm. how to tolerate distress. We yeah. know that the majority of autistic people can force themselves to tolerate distress for a certain amount of time, but then they have huge burnouts, huge mental health issues. Yeah. Um, and with children, we're seriously concerned about the autistic children in this country that are being taught compliance because we think that this is a form of grooming and it really leads them open to being seriously abused um, not not being able to trust themselves and having to comply with authority figures. So we're really strongly concerned about the human rights of autistic people in these kind of behavioral based compliance approaches. Yeah. Yeah. Tara, I'm just conscious of the the time that we'll just Okay. Well, yeah. we're just at the end anyway. Yeah, we, we are at the end anyway. We're fine. Yeah. yeah. So with this, um, and again, we've touched on it earlier, but you know, we reject neurotypical social skills training. We reject being told there's one way to be. Um, you know, you have to you have to learn how to make eye contact. You have to ha hold a conversation this way. Um, and what happens is that people who are taught that taught to, re to repress their own way of being and to um, that there is this one particular way of doing socialization and trying to and do it that way, they can't get it perfectly right. And so they're always going to feel like a failure in the first place. It's never going to fit. It's like putting on somebody else's skin. It just doesn't work. So. Um, we reject that as, you know, this is, oh, this is the old way of, you know, look at left-handedness. We taught children left-handedness was bad, you can't do it, and we trained them that they have to use the right hand. And so uh, we don't know what the consequences were, were that, that were, sorry, what the consequences were of that, but we know it isn't good for people. Um, similarly here, to say that there's one gold standard typical way of socializing and every other way is wrong is just ludicrous. So no, if you if yeah. there's there's definite benefit in um, helping uh, people to communicate um, in different languages and different cultures, but not to hold up one as as the perfect model and everybody else has to be that that. Exactly, that all children. So for example, if, if you were talk, looking specifically at children, that the children would learn about all different types of communicating, so that the neurotypical children would also be taught. That, you know, for example, an autistic way of, of communicating information might be to talk at length about one topic. And then that the so you know, if you had a class with a mix who was a mix of neurodivergence, that they'd learn about all different types of communication and that all those type different types of communication are okay and just as valid as each other. So again, it's not about not teaching skills, but it's about respecting and and teaching um everybody about all the different perspectives. Yeah. Um, so again, advocating, you know what, we've, we've really, we've spoken about this a lot already. So actually, I'll just really briefly say that, you know, if, if you're working with autistic children, neurodivergent children, it's not a matter, it's like that Desmond Tutu quote, you know, we have to stop, uh, you know, pulling people out of the river and instead figure out why they're falling into the river in the first place. But with, with neurodivergent people, we actually know why they're falling into the river in the first place. And the reason is the systems around them, the rejection the, um, you know, the pathologizing of their ways of being, they're being misdiagnosed all over the place with borderline personality disorder, you know, they're being taught from a very young age that they're supposed to stop stimming, um, you know, sit still, be different, be like everybody else, uh, you know, mask, learn these social skills, and it causes massive mental health issues, and um, all of those kind of things. So we really need to start, it's, it's, it's not good enough to 
just provide therapy or just assess in a positive or neurodiversity affirmative way. It's also about changing the systems around that. And some of the ways that you can do that in a really practical way, if you're supporting a charity, for example, um, that supports neurodivergent people, it's about looking, are there neurodivergent board members on that charity? So if there's no neurodivergent board members on that charity, there's, there's problems with that charity. So it's about contacting them, you know, send them an email. Are there any neurodivergent board members on your on your um, on your board um, and that creates a little bit of pressure there and if there's none maybe give your support to, to a different charity if you're doing research it's about you know if you're if you're reviewing a bit of, bit of research we're autistic people we're if it's about ADHD we're ADHDers involved from the very start do the goals align with the do the goals align with the community with the community you're looking for um, Oh, if there's a conference, are there autistic speakers? Did autistic people or other, or if it's an ADHD or, or whatever, is were they involved from the very start as well? Or is there just a token person coming along? Um, and ask about that. And then even if, if you yourself are asked to speak about something, um, you know, make sure that there's other neurodivergent people there with you if you're talking about a topic or have them, I'm oh, sorry, this is, that's, <laughs> I mean, Tara, Tara could have actually given this entire webinar without me here. So that's uh, that's me highlighting myself for, you know, showing my professional ego there. But, you know, sometimes there's somebody else better that could present rather than you as if you are a neurotypical person, you know, and sometimes uh, I, uh, hello. I think we're, we're like Pam and Louise here. <laughs> I just realized I realized halfway through my point I was like oh actually Tara should be here not me but you know um so it's about creating pressure because when you create pressure for conference organizers and researchers and departments and boards that's when people and they're starting to know that but they're that's when when things will start to change people go do you know what we actually have to get our act together here because it's going to look bad and I know we shouldn't do things because it's going to look bad but that's what creating pressure is and that's what advocating for for change is all about. Um, and we have, I know we're just at the end of time here, but we have already spoken about this, you know, fostering a positive neurodivergent identity. And that is really key. We've done a lot of work in Thriving Autistic at developing, um, listening to the communities, the wider community and developing a program around how to help foster that positive identity. Um, for autistic people and, and see, you know, we know the, the well-being outcomes from the research coming in from um, over the past couple of years are that it just makes such a huge difference to mental health outcomes for people to be positive about their own identity. And it, and it just makes sense too. So that's really a core goal for us. And I would hope for anybody who's, who's involved in any kind of supports or therapeutic services for neurodivergence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then lastly, again, we've covered this already, that all neurodivergent people deserve an equal voice of power. And that includes, for example, the non-speaking community um, and other communities with more significantly higher care needs. Because what can happen is that sometimes, you know, people will say, oh, about somebody with low care needs, who, who's very articulate verbally, for example, oh, they don't speak for the whole community. But then when people with quite who are non-speaking or have maybe a significant intellectual disability try to speak out and um, people don't listen to them either because they think, oh, well, they don't really know what they're what they're you know, they, they need support. They don't really know what they're saying. So it's just really, really important because there are, for example, the non-speaking community ha are, are actually quite a strong voice and do speak yeah. out about, about and there are ways to tap into what they want and how what they believe the neurodiversity movement the direction that it should go in and how what support that they want so it's about really making effort to, to you know not just talk to the neurodivergent people who are the high flyers and articulate and and you know running businesses but also really really make sure to tap into all the voices yeah um, yeah do you want to add anything there Tara? a hundred percent i think that um, one thing the neurodivergent community online does pretty well is making space for all voices to be heard mm -hmm. um, where we're falling down, I think, in um, in the UK and Ireland anyway, is making enough space for people of colour who are neurodivergent. Yeah, um, that's yeah. an area that we're really, really, really mindful and pushing in Thriving Autistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. So yeah. That's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Only five minutes over, Tara. Wow, that is that's our record. record. <laughs> Seriously.
Well, Thank you so much for sticking with us. Yeah. I, 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 I must say, Davida and Tara, your, your talk has, has been excellent. And for me, it's been both insightful and refreshing. And I, 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 I feel that you've really captured the zeitgeist of, of what is happening and, in fact, what needs to happen uh, moving ahead. I'm not going to take up too much time because I want to get to as many questions as we can. So in handing over to Beth and Ken with the questions, perhaps you could briefly comment on the concept of ableism and ableist language and how we can recognize and challenge ableist language. Um, if you might like to say a few more words on that. Do you want to start, Davida? I'm going to have some water. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So ableism, it's a very new word for me, I'll be honest. Um, I think that, you know, it, it, it's similar to racism and sexism. It's the discrimination of people um, with uh, a disability. But I think I read somewhere, you know, that it's the last kind of accepted form of ism that there is. And I think that, you know, it, that a large part of the time we don't even notice it. It's, it's so ingrained in us that we don't even see it. Um, certainly for the neurodivergent community, examples of ableism would be that, um, oh, you know, job applications that are really, really incomprehensible, very, 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 you know, very, very hard to follow a lot of verbal text, or that we see, for example, um, saying, oh, that's babyish, uh, not, you know, not letting adults enjoy, I don't know. Elmo, for example, and saying, no, you know, and that's across, you know, that, that that's babyish, you shouldn't like that. Or say, for example, the expression, um, like often, like, not all, I don't want to generalize, but say, for example, that a lot of neurodivergent people would have, you know, big expressed emotions, for example, when they're really upset, or really happy, but there's a, but that we have this idea like, oh no, you're not supposed to show big emotions. You're not supposed to cry in public. Um, so they're like small little examples of ableism. Um, I mean, there's the obvious ones like not having ramps for wheelchair users is, is ableism. Um, but it, it does take a lot of realizing, it, you know, it's a hard one, isn't it? I catch myself all the time. And you know what, that's why it's so important actually to have neurodivergent team members, because oftentimes I'll go off on one and I won't even realize that I'm being ableist. And then someone will very nicely go, um, Davida, did you think, I'm just wondering X, Y, Z, and suddenly I'll realize, oh my God, yes, that was completely ableist. Sorry. And I think as well, things like, you know, in terms of barriers, things like, um, particularly in, in the services that a lot of you will possibly be involved in, you know, having to make appointments by telephone mm. that's incredibly difficult for the vast majority of specifically autistic people it costs so much energy to do it it's in fact there's a paper recently published by an autistic doctor um, around that around that being one of the major barriers to healthcare that people will put off even contacting their doctor when they're really seriously ill um, or put off going because they have to do it by telephone. And that's, you know, that ableist where, the, where, where because they can do it once, it's expected they should always be able to do it. Mm. Um, but even then, this internalized ableism for a lot of adults who are late diagnosed, yes. to come to terms with the fact that maybe their periods of burnout or their spotty work history or the difficulty throughout their life was to do with their neurotype rather than them, th there being something wrong with them. It's just their neurotype, but that also, that, that is a disability. That's very difficult for a lot of autistic adults and late diagnosed ADHD adults to take on board because of internalized ableism, of thinking that even the, you know, dis disability is a, is a bad word or something. And that comes from that idea of, you know, that we're brought up in this capitalist society where you're only of use if you can produce and, um, and, and that's, it's really, you know, I suppose, unlearning all of that consciously. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. And Ken. Thanks. I just want to say thanks to both Davida and Tara. I mean, and just to say the, the comments that are coming into the chat, everybody saying wonderful things about you. Um, there's so many questions there. I'm not sure we're going to get through them all between now and six. So we might need to run over five or 10 minutes on that. Oh, I'm okay to run over. If, yeah, it's no problem for me. Um, yeah. I just, Personally, just go with the first one that came in from Karen De Castri, um, and she's a speech pathologist, um, and she said something about training past point. So she totally agreed with herself when talking about the stimming. Uh, but the fact that she's a clinician, I thought her question was interesting. And she says, 
is it ultimately our job to help other people understand the autistic person? Yes, that's I'm becoming more and more. Yes, particularly in the in, in the child work that, you know, I, I've switched around like our number one recommendation now in our um, autism assessment reports are that the people around the child need to learn about autism. Yeah. And, and become more accepting of of difference. Yeah. I think that, that any clinician is in such a brilliant position to make a huge change for that family, because remember mm. that um, the, 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 the well, I, certainly in our experience anyway, the majority of people coming through to us who are younger for, for diagnosis have at least one neurodivergent parent. Mm. So yeah. you, as a clinician, seeing one member of a family, you have the possibility to really transform the, the fortunes of that family in terms of their mental well-being. Yeah. And also the thing is that once the people around them understand autism, or sorry, or not just autism, I know that I've been doing that all night, but once they understand, then they'll be able to help better. Because if you don't have the real understanding, you're not gonna know when to help. So, it, I mean, it's not that that child won't need specific tactics also, of course they very well might. But yes, without that understanding from the people around them, um, it's not gonna go very far. If yeah. I might just throw in just a quick associated question that came in there um, before we hand over to Beth. Um, do you have that advice for autistic psychologists? Now, I think we would substitute the word clinician here for psychologists mm -hmm. who would like to come out um, as, as being autistic at work, but for reasons you've already touched on, uh, uh, back at misconceptions, ETC. Yeah, like we would work one-to-one um, -one really because with people who are, who are kind of navigating disclosure in their personal life or in their work life. You know, it really depends on each person's unique circumstances, their, their work circumstances, their line manager, if they're, if they're not in private practice. Um, and, and just the whole environment that they're in, it's really, it's so nuanced. I think it, it needs to be handled really carefully. It, that would be my yeah. take. What would you say, Davida? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I only know from 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 things that peop, stories people have told me, um, you know, uh, it can really vary. I mean, people, there have been positive stories, but then, I mean, it's easy for me to say because I'm not one of the change makers, but then the more people that, and I would never encourage somebody to disclose, it's absolutely, as Tara said, it's up to individual people, but more and more people are disclosing now. And I think it's they're they're going to make it easier for the people coming up underneath them to do that um so i mean it's terrifying like i was terrified doing the first webinar and you know when i remember when we were starting the practice and we were putting our names up and i was absolutely terrified what was going to happen <laughs> but i suppose luckily i'm working for myself so i'm in a different situation but even still it's it's quite you know and i know from um, from other other psychologists that they might find either having a fantastic response or a very mixed response mm. um, or a very negative response. So that's why I think it really needs to be kind of unpacked in, in a yeah. safe space for somebody. Yeah, but when it goes well, Tara, wouldn't you agree that the, the benefit of being your authentic self? Oh, wow. It's just so fantastic. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's absolutely priceless. It's, it's yeah. so grateful to have to have embraced this journey and, and where it's taking me, yeah. Um, and even since starting Thriving Autistic, and we, as I said, we have 21 now, um, and a number of them have come out publicly after being with us for a little while, um, just because it became so much freer in their work when they were working with other neurodivergent people and around other neurodivergent practitioners that they felt, you know what, in, in the rest of their lives, it, 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 they just needed to have that freedom to be themselves and, and they decided to go for it. And it really was, was wonderful. But, you know, there are some cautionary tales too. So I think there's yeah. no one size fits all. No, and it's so, I mean, the power of it, you know, in, for example, child assessments, um, that one of our team members is in the children's clinic is autistic and, and, um, they were telling me that during the the interview, you know, the, the child interview with a couple of the team members, that they were talking about being autistic and the child lit up and it was just, it was, it just adds to the therapeutic because our big thing is that, you know, assessments should be therapeutic, whether they're with children or adults. And the therapeutic nature for a child coming into for this assessment that isn't deficit focused. And not only that, but one of the people they've come in to see is autistic and they had a great chat about ear defenders and, you know, so the power in, 
in that for clients is 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 huge as well. Um, but anyway, it is a nuanced. Okay, that's actually what I really appreciate it. And mm. um, I'm sure Beth has a couple more questions for you. Uh, so there's a question here from Mark, and it's about um, creating equity in the workplace. So um, he says that in his experience in, in work, he's had various conversations around how I work and having managers seeking to fix me. It took the diagnosis for me to finally accept myself. In business groups, it's not so much about neurodiverse hires, but more about equity in the processes and environments in the workplace. Uh, that question has just disappeared as I was reading it. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> um, Mark, was, <laughs> Mark is looking for your thoughts on um, creating true equity in the workplace. Yeah, that is a hard one, isn't it? I kind of feel like a huge amount needs to be done just in terms of um, societal expectations around behavior. You know, that that the more that... that that we, this isn't really answering this question, but that there's more acceptance of that. The more people are open in the workplace, like, yeah, I'm autistic. I, I, need, to, I need to go have some quiet space, for example. Um, that there'll be less, it'll, it'll stop appearing odd. You know, I, I think that that's a huge part of it in that there's, there's a lot of discrimination with it. There's a lot of discrimination because of how people, sorry, you know what a huge part of it is as well in interview, because uh, up until now, and I know there's a lot of work being done in this, is that extremely, and we, there's loads of statistics and loads of research around this, that extremely intelligent, highly qualified neurodivergent people don't get through the interview because we have such stringent standards around you know, people being, fr whatever, you know, appearing affable or uh, engaging in a bit of chit chat and they don't get through that, that interview. So I think a lot of work with employers around um, neurodivergence and um, fitting the job to the person rather than, you know, expecting certain things in the interview is important. Tara, yeah. do you? Yeah, I mean, look, I, we've we've done other trainings on this and we could be, you know, at least three hours scratching the surface of, yeah, of equity in the workplace and what it needs to be just reimagined from from the ground up, really. Yeah. Um. so the, but but all of the points in those 12 points made today, they each of those would really go a long way towards um, even in a workplace context as well, towards shifting mm. Um. This this yeah. just such a huge topic. Those neurodivergent to see the neuro, neurodivergent networks opening in lots of the bigger workplaces and some of the universities for staff as well as students, which I think is really vitally important. And then just to make sure, again, that the neurodivergent voice is at the center. If you're opening a network, that it's not just those adjacent to neurodiversity, but those who are actually neurodivergent themselves are leading it, and that will make it more safe for people within an organization to start gathering and even discussing the needs that they have and, and collectively will have a more powerful voice. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Ken, have you another question there? Yeah, um, just before, just, just to acknowledge there was a question in from uh, Julian Casey, saying it was more of a statement than a question, in that, you know, we sort of mentioned autism and ADHD tonight, but the, the neurodiversity spectrum goes much further. That includes mm. dyspraxia, dyspraxia, Tourette's, and other conditions as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But I am from ADHD, and so forgive me for going for the ADHD <laughs> question. Um, my daughter has requested to get an official diagnosis of ADHD. What are your suggestions to helping her interpret the results through this framework of neurotype and not disorder? Sorry, a bit of that broke up. It's about how do you help her interpret see it the as results? A yeah, uh, interpret the results of her diagnosis through the framework of a neurotype as opposed yes. to disorder. Yes, interpret the results of her. Okay, okay. So ideally, what you would love to see is that, like, for example, with, with autism, we do that from the very start. So it's, it's it, you know, the diagnostic report is framed in a neuroaffirmative way. Um, I think that you can take, there's a, there's a psychiatrist called Ned, um, oh, I can't remember his last Halliwell. name. H Halliwell, thank you. And he has a great way of reframing, you know, that the flip side of impulsivity is creativity and, and you know, all of those kind of things. So I think if you, if, you, if you take away all the language around symptom disorder problem and you just look at it in terms of her as an individual person that, yeah, I don't know her, obviously, so I'm just throwing this out there, that, you know, 
yeah, you can be impulsive sometimes. And that's wonderful because you're also creative um, and that has this benefits, but sometimes you need to rein it in. Ned Halliwell talks about, you know, it's like a Ferrari that needs to be, uh, you know, that needs, needs to learn to put on the brakes and things like that. So I think it's more about fact in a very, in a much more factual rather than judgment based talking about the different things that uh, she needs a bit of support with and her different strengths. Um, Tara, what do you think there? Yeah, um, totally. And I think as well, um, well, really core and crucial would be to connect your daughter in with the, the ADHD community and the neurodivergent community. Like that's so core. The other thing, oh, just yeah. to mention the, the language, like, you know, ADHD and it being disorder, like the, the yeah. community, I don't think it, we're not settled. There hasn't been a name settled, a new, you know, a new version of what's it going to be called, but there's a lot of discussion within the community about some people call themselves ADHers. Um, so there's just, there's a lot, this conversation is evolving where we are today and what we're talking about today, I know will be different in three months. It'll have oh, moved definitely. on again. And that's yeah. why it's so important to be involved yeah. and listening um, on the different social networks and, and yeah. ask questions and, you know, to, to really see and help that, that movement evolve. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And there is, like, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I don't, I don't know her age, but there is a lot of, um, you know, again, really funny, you know, uh, like TikTok videos, for example, with they call themselves ADHDers at the moment mm -hmm. um, that will help her. You know, it's it's kind of her finding her, you know, seeing her community, people who are talking about their ADHD with children, particularly teen, if she's a teenager. I don't, sorry, I don't know how old she is, but um, it's not taking it so seriously that there's other people that she can identify with that are kind of laughing, that making videos about the fact that they haven't done the dishes, but they've, um, you know, developed 10 new projects in the past yeah. five minutes, you know? Um, yeah. So it's about taking the, taking some of the seriousness away from it as well. Um, and but as well if they want you know and i'm giving a plug here for our nonprofit. if if this person if the daughter wants to chat with an adhd psychologist or therapist to discuss these these issues you know and to discuss how do you reframe your strengths and challenges in a more neurodiversity affirmative way then we're there you know and that's why we founded this so um mm -hmm. you know there is there's support out there from the community and from neurodivergent professionals yeah and allies, amazing allies, like Davida. <laughs> and just maybe just throw in a bit, a bit of a curveball of a question that came out from Gail. If you don't mind, I'll sort of reinterpret Gail's question. Yeah. Um, and she talked about the uh, global human rights. And um, they're currently sort of redeveloping the strategic development goals. So um, should the right to neurodiversity be um, accepted as a human right? The right to neurodiversity? Well, uh, to be accepted as neurodiverse. To be oh. well, yeah, because it's because there's we're we're disabled, so you know all disabled people are have human rights. So I would have thought it's implicit, is it not? Yeah, maybe it's not it trying so to, as to a it. minority. I think maybe it's it's new to think of it as a mind think of neurodivergence or and the communities in it with as minority groups. When you think it's a, it's a new way of yeah, I do find out. that people are quite shocked when I say that you know we're a minority group and there's just it's, there's been too much prejudice against us to the point mm. that people are trying to erase who we are or else force us to pretend we're a, a different minority a different the majority yeah. group and that has to change we have human rights to be who we are that's quite shocking to lots of people because they've never even just thought of it like that they would have assumed we all want to change and be like them yeah yeah and the thing is that, that yes so i mean i am agreeing that 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 all neurodivergent people of course deserve equal rights and and um and equal access and i think that that you know we're a little bit behind like in terms of say for example equal access and i know we're terrible in ireland for example for wheelchair support but we know it is supposed to be you know legally people in wheelchairs are supposed to be given access to all public buildings. That's one example of um, disability supports. But say, for example, a neurodivergent person, um, what supports do they need? Like like, Tar like Tara said, is, is only allowing phone calls to make med medical appointments. In the future, are we going to see that in the same way as um, not providing a ramp for somebody in a wheelchair? 
Well, yeah. actually, seeing as you said that, the UN um, CRPD and there was a consultation group there last year, and I brought that point up. I said, I feel that this is, you know, this is an access need that the majority of autistic people have. We've researched to show that, and our government should be allowing that, particularly for accessing things like mental health services, which there is they have to be made by, by telephone. Um, and our GPs and so forth. Like it's it's against our human rights is, mm -hmm. um, in this country. So yeah, okay. I guess we agree with the person's question. Yeah, we agree with you. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's all emerging, yeah. Oh, does Beth want to ask a question or shall I flow on? Uh, Ken, do you want to go ahead? I think we'll take just one more one more question and then we might uh, then we might have to finish up there if you have one you want to, to ask. Yeah, I did have, I am um, just sorry, um, obviously there is tons of questions. So apologies if we didn't get to your question there. Uh, as I say, we could probably stay here till seven or eight o'clock. Um, there was a question from Lisa Silk. Um, what are your thoughts on, quote, um, autism awareness days, unquote, um, in schools? Is this approach helpful or damaging? And what can be done to educate, inform the general community and young people? What do you think, Tara? I think that's such a great work? question. Yeah, I think it's, it I think it's, um, it's how, it, how it's run. Yeah. Is it run with the autistic or neurodivergent voice at the center? And we're talking about autism awareness day. So it would need to be run and led by autistic people, not people adjacent to autism deciding what autistic people need. So I think that's at the core, you know, it could be yeah. really great, but we need to move beyond awareness mm -hmm. and we need to recognize the rights of neurodivergent people. And we need to maybe start thinking in terms of different cultures, you know, social norms, different social norms, and, and learning about each other's language and way of being instead of, again, you know, just saying, oh, everybody, hey, look, there's this group over there, you know, and let's accept them. <laughs> so we need yeah. to pass that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we should all be aware at this stage. I know what you're saying, like, they can be very patronized. Some of the stuff that happens on, on autism, you know, a lot of autistic yeah. people would say like they dread autism day. Oh, loads of us go off social yeah. media for even the weeks up to yeah. it. It's very traumatizing for a lot of people to see yeah. ourselves talked over and ignored or and our community's mm -hmm. needs just totally ignored. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't mean, say, for example, I know that the question was, was about schools, but like in Ireland, for example, as I am do great work going into schools, they're obviously autistic led going into schools and doing talks about autism. But it's from, as you know, as Tara highlighted, the autistic community, the information is coming from from the autistic community. So it's not that so more talk about autism and talk about neurodivergence and difference in schools is really positive. But the the yeah. But it's how you talk about it, isn't it? It's how you talk how about, you talk about okay. it. Okay. And who is involved in the talk? Who has the power to yeah to talk? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So so thank you so much, Davida and Tara. I'm sure we've all found this evening so so insightful. I know I have. Uh, it's really opened my mind, challenged my mind, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, we're sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, uh, but a big thank you to Ken and Bet for uh, fielding as many as we could. Uh, everyone, we've been joined this evening by Davida Hartman of the Children's Clinic and the Adult Autism Clinic and by Tara O'Donnell Killen uh, from Thriving Autistic. Uh, I must say, I really look forward to uh, getting and reading your book when it comes out next year because your views are, are so refreshing. I really mean that. Uh, I, I think it's an important uh, dialogue and discussion to continue. Uh, next time out, uh, we're joined by Dr. Uh, Seanad Anderson, who will talk about tics and Tourette syndrome. And later in the spring, we'll be joined by uh, Kwona Rankin, uh, dyslexia coordinator in uh, uh, London in the College of Art. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us, and it would be good to see you next time. Take care. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for thank having you. us. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks very Thanks, much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.